welcome to another video by Adrian Davey from Pure Electric. In this video, I want to talk about prescribed zones, why we use them and who we are protecting, which will then enable us to better understand why they are there. The first thing to look at is Regulation 522, Protection Against the Expected External Influence. So what are they? So basically, this is namely things like impact damage from a nail, screw, from hanging wall pictures, fixings for furniture like shelves and from other trades DIYers going about their ordinary tasks around the property. I would like to draw particular note at this point to the following. Particular care shall be taken at changes in direction from where wiring enters into equipment and I want you to hold that thought on which I'll come back to later. So why do the prescribed zones exist? Well if you think about it it is to enable those that aren't electrically skilled and that could be DIYers or other tradespeople um, just any anyone around the house that could be helping somebody put something up on the wall. So why do the prescribed zones exist? If you think about it, prescribed zones aren't there to enable electricians to run their cables as such. That's a secondary thought um, because there's lots of ways that we can run our cables. They don't particularly have to be in twin and earth in the wall. They could be in conduit or SWA, which would be a safer cable to, to have buried. So it's not for that purpose. It's more for the purpose of protecting people that are not electrically skilled, and that can be DIYers or tradespeople, from inadvertently damaging that cable and getting an electric shock. And there's a case that I'm going to talk about at the end of this video about a lady called Mary Werry, who died in her kitchen from exactly this problem. A cable was run at a very slight angle, five degrees, which meant it came out of its prescribed zone. Kitchen utensil rack was installed uh, across the cable uh, that was unknown at the time. And the husband who fitted had screwed in not far enough to damage the cable, but was literally right beside it. And over the years, three years later, in fact, that cable became damaged to the point where the rack became live and they were getting what they thought were static shocks and her leg was touching the appliance. She touched the, um, the rack and she died instantly. And this was an avoidable death case. So this is why the prescribed zones are there. <clears throat> we need to analyze the text. So the regulation in particular is 522.6.202. What I want to do is then analyze this section of the text. The cable may be installed either horizontally or vertically. This implies one or the other, not both. So the word may is a model verb. It implies choice. The word or suggests there is a choice. It's either one or the other. Otherwise, it would have said horizontally and or vertically in the same sentence, which it doesn't. So here's a typical example. You drill in. Most drills are double insulated, but you could touch the drill bit, damage the cable that screw. You can insert it, it becomes live. In this instance, obviously, you're relying on the 30 milliamp RCD for protection to pick up the imbalance of the load. Now, what works best down the CB seal between the live conductors, but the worst case scenario is through you. Now, that works best down the CPC or between the live conductors, which would be here and here without actually coming out of the wall. But if you haven't damaged, if, if the connection isn't between these two parts or three parts of the cable, then the electricity has is, is got no choice but to come this way. That's the only path that it can, can go down, especially if you're touching this, obviously, and you're, you're uh, creating the circuit. So another way of complying with this regulation is to install cables that contain earth metallic protection. So again, what I've drawn here is a steel wide armored cable. This could be conduit as well. And what would then happen is as the drill goes through that mechanical um, metallic protection, the earth metallic protection, the path for the electricity to travel is only very small on the end of the drill bit. And most of the electrical current, the majority of the electrical current is going to go down the um, earth metallic protection, which will then cause the um, RCD or the overcurrent protective de device to operate within the desired time, thus you know, minimizing the amount of electricity that's going to to uh, impact on the person drilling the hole. So what does the on-site guide say? Well, effectively, it repeats everything that we've just spoken about, kind of puts it a bit back into layman terms, but it still says horizontally or vertically to an accessory or consumer unit. It doesn't say that you can zigzag across the wall, which is what a lot of people are doing. And this, this diagram here, 
I always felt was lacking in content. Okay, it was a very basic drawing. It doesn't show any accessories or examples of what you cannot do. So what I mean is it doesn't show a double socket down here and then the cable zigzagging through um, different prescribed zones, making its way to a different location. What it tries to clearly show is that you either come from all the way down to an accessory or all the way horizontally to an accessory. It just never really, it lacked a bit. So then there's other diagrams that you will see if you type this in online. And this is, this was in my NIC EIC 17th edition toolbox guide. And I feel like the NIC EIC brought out this guide to try and expand on the basic diagram in the on-site guide, which I feel only muddied the water further and gave people with very little knowledge and understanding or basic minimum knowledge and understanding of, a, of the regulation, and it gave them a tool with which to argue their misinterpretation. Because if you now look at this, you can see how people were getting confused. It appears to show all the prescribed zones crossing easily into one another. So for instance, I could go from this socket up here and then suddenly change direction and come along to this point here and, and vice versa. You know, I could zigzag all the way around this without actually hitting anything. Um, and I think this is what adds to the confusion. Again, it does say down here, zone either, so again, it implies that there's a choice horizontally or vertically. So again, here is the choice. So this implies choice. This is the choice, horizontally or vertically, to the point accessory or switch gear on the surface of the wall of partition to which the cable is connected. Had they colored the horizontal and vertical prescribed zones a different color, or even explains that you could not simply change direction through zones in the middle of nowhere, I believe we would have not had the confusion that we currently have. And I'll, I'll get onto that in a, in a bit. So one thing that I always try to think about, so going back to this picture in the on-site guide, when I'm on-site, I observe what other trades are doing and how they work. And I've always wondered who came up with this 150 millimeter picture frame effectively uh, across the top of the ceiling and down the sides, because after all, where do plumbers drop their pipes? They tend to drop them down in the corner of a wall. So when they're going to be drilling down to or drilling in to fix their saddles, they're going to be drilling through all the cables that are then run in that corner. And then effectively, you've got then the potential of a whole pipe becoming like um, if it wasn't earthed properly. Um, again, carpenters fixing their shelves. You know, if they were spanning this shelf here, chances are they would fix in the corner and maybe at a midway point to pick up the load in the middle. So I've never understood where this came from. For me, this is, this is the worst case scenario. If you've got no other choice, then this is what you should do. At all other times, you should avoid this like the plague. So next time you're on site, pay attention to where other trades work. Ask yourself whether you think this is a good idea. After all, you can choose not to use these zones. Like I said, I avoid them wherever possible and can honestly say that I've never actually used this 150 millimeter gap ever. And I've been, I've been working for 20 years. There is always a way around it. So chase depths for walls is another topic that I'd like to talk about because I see a lot of people buying their brand new chase machines and then just cracking on with it at full depth all the way along the wall. There is a limit on the depth of chases. It says here that a vertical chase should not be deeper than one third of the wall thickness or in a cavity wall, one third of the relevant leaf. And what that basically means is obviously with cavity wall, you have two leaves, inner leaf, outer leaf. And it's the obviously whatever leaf you're chasing into. Horizontal chases should not be deeper than one sixth of the wall. So again, that's shallower when you're going horizontal. So on a hundred millimeter wall, the vertical chase can be no more than 33 millimeters, or in fact, 33.333 reoccurring. And again, you can take in the, obviously the plaster that goes onto the front of that. And in horizontal chase, that would be 16.6 millimeters reoccurring. So you, again, if you're trying to chase in a 20 mil uh, piece of conduit, you have to consider whether you've actually got enough depth there uh, in total. It says here that cha chases should not position so as to impair the stability of the wall, so they, they shouldn't crisscross over each other. Um, I'm going to get onto this 
more in a minute and try to explain this, but it also suggests that back-to-back -back chases are not permitted because obviously if you're chasing back-to-back, -back, you've taken 33 mil out of one side, 33 millimeters out of the other, that's 66 millimeters, well that only leaves 34 millimeters in the middle. Something else that's worth considering as well is that for hollow or cellular blocks, maintain a residual thickness of 15 millimeters between the chase and the void. So the void is the bit that's basically the hollow inside, unless recommended by the manufacturer. So you have to be very careful with hollow or cellular blocks. What I've done myself, whether it's right or wrong, but I'm gonna throw this idea out there, where I've chased into a hollow block, I've actually filled that block with concrete so that it becomes a solid block, uh, thus, um, making it more stable inside. This is how a wall spreads its load. So effectively, we've got the weight pushing down here and the, the load is spread diagonally. So this top brick, well, it's spread between these two bricks and these two bricks share their loading with the three bricks underneath that and on and on and on it goes. So the load is spread diagonally across the wall. So if we think about these vertical chases again, a chase that's a third of the wall thick here isn't going to impact on the stability of this wall because the force is pushing downwards, not from the sides. However, horizontal chases, as you can see from this, they cut right across that loading, which is why they're a lot shallower. And I want you to think about that when you're chasing in your sockets. It definitely requires some thought, and I will try to find a definitive answer for you, but for now, you need to use your engineering judgment based on the information that I'm providing you. Here's a small chase, um, which, you know, again, you can look at this and it's not going to impact on the structural stability too much. But if you were to chase all the way along, it would. You can't just whip around the corner of sockets either. So technically you would be outside of the zones. Now I was on a job once, and I mean, this was a long time ago. This must be, I was with the NIC EIC at the time, so that must be a good 12, 13 years ago. And I was on a job where I'd been called out to have a look at another contractor's work who was also with the NIC EIC. And he had done just this, and the builder was concerned about the level of workmanship that had gone on. And I came round and, and had a look, and I said, yeah, that, that doesn't look right. I mean, he's outside the zones. He's an NIC EIC contractor. You need to contact them and get them around. Anyway, they turned up, they had a look and they got him, they got the contractor to rip it all out and put it right. So that tells me everything that you need to know about this problem. And also as well, if you think about this from a sort of DIY or electrically unskilled person or even a skilled person come, you know, come to think of it, if you didn't know this cable was here and you wanted to chase along this wall to another socket. You know, as soon as you start chasing into that, you're going to damage that cable and you wouldn't even know that cable was there because chances are it's supplying a different circuit. So, you know, this is a big, a big no-no. Okay, here is a basic diagram showing how you could run between two points in the wiring, either horizontally or vertically. So what I've done here is I've marked the zones, the prescribed zones. Obviously, the easiest, quickest and safest way to comply with the regulations is to take the shortest route. And if their sockets are low level, then it would be from the floor upwards. This makes it really easy to use up the rest of this space for decorations, mirrors, um, furniture, etc. It's also a good idea to keep your circuits um, the shortest possible so that you get the best readings and the lowest values so that your overcurrent protective device is going to trip out the quick. Um, buried cables should be kept to a minimum and vertical, not horizontal, thus minimizing impact on the wall structurally. So yes, you can go horizontally, but again, vertically is best. So again, you know, I've just shown here the horizontal chase would have to be seriously considered in this instance and depending on the length and you have to consider the longer the chase the more impact it has on the structural integrity of the wall. Now I've come up with a ratio uh, later on which I want to discuss with you about how far I'm prepared to chase horizontally before I then chase upwards and in this instance because the sockets are let's say a maximum of 400 millimeters off the floor I would not chase more than 400 millimeters horizontally 
because otherwise I might as well just go back down again, come across and back up here and chase this part out for 400, thus saving damage structurally to the wall. Again, for switched, for drops to sockets with a solid floor, I would still keep my chases vertical to avoid impacting on the structural integrity of the wall. And if going horizontal, I'd consider the following ratio. I've, I've come up with this. This is something that I was just thinking about today, a way of, of justifying it. So if you think that a vertical chase is one third and a horizontal chase is one sixth, if we divided those into each other, we would get a ratio of 0.48. And if we use that ratio, then let's say that the switch drop was two and a half meters. Sorry, the drop to the sockets was two and a half meters. If I times that by 0.48, then the maximum length of chase horizontally before it would impact on the, the structure, the, the rate, you know, the structural integrity of the wall would be 1.2 meters. And that kind of makes sense to me because anything over that, well, you might as well just do another chase down here vertically and less impact on the wall and also make it easier for people to then use up the space in between. So I'd like you to kind of give some thought to this. I mean, it isn't something that I've just come up with. I couldn't find any guidance anywhere else. So let me know what your thoughts are on this. See what you think. Here I've highlighted the prescribed zones for a typical lighting situation. So effectively here we've got a one gang switch and we've got two wall lights. Now again, what I would do is I would chase all the way up, go into the floor void where you've got less chance of being damaged, come down to the light, then back up, all the way along, back down and back up again. And by doing that, you're also avoiding usually the fixing holes, which would be either side of the light. So you probably end up with a fixing hole here and here, here and here. And I would be able to avoid the cable doing so. Again, you could go all the way between the two light points horizontally, but I would suggest that you do a risk assessment. Again, considering the length of the chase, you also need to start thinking about the wall structure and design. So for instance, a bungaroosh wall with flints and all that kind of stuff in it, isn't going to be as stable as a brick wall. You need to think about that. Um, you also need to, like I say, think about the fixing of the light fit fixings for the light fittings, because they're usually mounted horizontally. And I would only personally ever use this method going horizontally between two lights if there was no other way of doing it. Again, I'm not a fan of horizontal chases, and quite a few people I know echo that because of the structural impact. Now here what i've done is i've shown what i've been seeing on social media so if you remember back to the beginning of the video i mentioned regulation 522 so particular care shall be taken at changes of direction if you change direction in the middle of nowhere how are electrically unskilled people ever going to know about prescribed zones i mean a lot of electricians don't seem to know about prescribed zones well almost certainly other trades do not know about prescribed zones it seems like we're the only ones that are privy to the information. So how the hell is a, a homeowner or a DIYer ever going to know about prescribed zones? I don't understand why people do this, when in my opinion, quite a few electricians don't understand what the prescribed zones mean. So think about it logically. Why are the zones horizontal and vertical? It's so that someone can take off the socket and easily see which way the cable is going and at least stand a chance at avoiding it by drawing a level line in the direction the cable goes to the next accessory or corner of the room. So what I mean by that is if I was to then lift, take this face plate off, I would see a cable going up. I should be able to stick a laser level on that or a standard level, mark either side of that cable and draw a level vertical line all the way up, knowing that that cable will be inside that level. It would be unreasonable impractical and nigh on impossible to expect anyone, let alone electricians, homeowners, the average person, to draw all these lines across a wall, shade them in and think, right, okay, I'm not going to draw, I'm not going to drill here, okay, I can't drill here, I can't drill here, I can't drill here, and only be able to drill in here to try and avoid a cable. That just isn't reasonable, which is why I genuinely think that the majority of electricians are wrong in their judgment of this because you need to think about what this regulation is for is to protect people that don't know and if they don't know about prescribed zones they're definitely not going to know about 
laying this out. So this is from the LABC technical manual version 10. Again, you can see the picture is very clear with no prescribed zones from other accessories crisscrossing around the wall. It specifies providing vertical runs from ceilings to all sockets and switches and suggests alternative supplies vertically from floor void below or horizontally from corner zones. So this is a lot clearer as well, I have to say. So provide vertical cabling run from ceiling to all switches and sockets, or as an alternative, you can come up from the floor or you can go horizontally from a corner zone, okay? Again, on this side, they've shown that very clearly. It also says here that cables to switch or outlet must be, must be horizontal. Again, there's that word, or vertical, one or the other, okay? And again, it details that in the picture. Don't forget as well that the building regulations are statutory. And BS7671 is the minimum safe standard and is also non-statutory. And we also should be working from BS7671, not to it. And what that means is we should be installing to best practice. BS7671 is the minimum safe standard. Best practice is head and shoulders above. One further note I would like to bring to your attention on this page is the, this note here. Timber frame walls cannot be drilled in horizontal zone unless designed by the timber frame designer. I don't think this is suggesting a stud wall, otherwise I think it would have said stud wall. I think this is more for a timber frame structure, one that would be purpose built, um, but I, it would be great to see some clarification on this from the LABC. Here's an example that I found on the internet. Now, I'm not suggesting that the electrician who installed this is in the wrong, as he says that the wall is coming out 50 mil. So according to the regs, if the wall comes out 50 mil, None of this matters. He could have gone diagonally. Personally, I wouldn't use this as an excuse to do this, but that's just my opinion. And then it's not my job. But I'm going to use this picture to highlight how someone could interpret the regulations incorrectly and, in fact, put electrically unskilled people at risk. Because once this is plastered, no one is going to know where these cable runs exist. I mean, look at the way this is coming all the way across there. You know, you're not going to suddenly know that this changes direction here or here and comes into these cables here. This here actually goes down between two uh, sockets all the way to floor to ceiling. So you wouldn't know that that crosses all the way over. Again, look, look at this change of direction here it's in the middle of nowhere, you wouldn't know that that was there. It, it really, it's a minefield. If people try to interpret it the way that they're interpreting it, it just opens up a minefield of problems. And in my opinion, my humble opinion, that is not what this regulation is for. It's here to protect electrically unskilled people or other trades from getting hurt. One lesson that we've learned from the death of Mary Werry is that it could be years later and in front of the children, which is what happened to her. So I want you to think about the devastation that it could cause to someone else's life and how easily that could have been avoided. We can't rely on RCD protection to save people's lives because there are so many things that can go wrong with RCD protection and they are most definitely not infallible. As I always say, prevention is better than cure. Here I've mapped out a basic kitchen elevation type drawing and then put the prescribed zones in to show how complicated it would be for someone not electrically skilled to try and avoid the cable. So here's the horizontal zones, here's the vertical zones. I mean, that is a logistical nightmare for any kitchen fitter looking to secure their cupboards back, to secure their uh, appliances back you know that is unrealistic anyone that's suggesting that that is an option needs to seriously listen to this video and consider what I'm saying to you now I've tried to show the kind of wiring that I see going on on social media as you can see it's very complicated and anyone who came in afterwards after it was plastered would have no idea where any of the, those cables were especially the ones that cross backward and forward this one here coming this way then coming back then dropping down comes along here, changes direction in the middle of nowhere, then comes all the way through here, back up along. This, and because they don't want to go through this chase here, because they don't want to impact on their sockets, they then drop up into the, you know, the safe zone of the switch, come all the way along here, 
and then drop back down again to complete the ring. It definitely wouldn't be there to help non-electrically skilled people avoid drilling or damaging a cable. And that is exactly what regulation 522.6.202 is for. Now that it's been plastered and decorated, if you hadn't seen them, would you be able to tell me where those cables were? I really don't think you would. I mean, absolutely not. So it, it completely defeats the object, the objective of that regulation. People just don't stand a chance if you if you overcomplicate this issue. So here's what I would have done. As you can see, it's a lot easier to see what's going on. You only have to drop an accessory off the wall to see which way the cable goes. And you would know that it travels straight to the floor, ceiling or accessory in accordance with regulation 522.6.202. It just makes it so much easier for everybody involved to avoid cables. You know, all this, all this bit in between now is free for somebody to secure fixing it. So again, plastered, you tell me which one you think is the safest. And I know which side of the fence I'm on that. Hopefully by the end of this video, you guys will think about what I've said and, you know, food for thought and hopefully, you know, take that into consideration when you're installing cables. So here's an example of a kitchen chased out with all the cables going down onto the floor. And I know what you're thinking, that's all well and good, but what if the floor is solid? But well, here's an example of what I did to get around the problem. Whenever I'm wiring kitchens, I tend to clip the cables behind units if, if, if it's easier. Put a laser level along, I draw a level line and I clip my cables either side of that line. And then I only chase down just to get below the worktop. And once the kitchen cupboards are in front, you know, it's hidden in the void. Nobody's going to see any of that. On this side, I've got a plasterboard wall, so it wasn't easy to clip the cable. So what I've done here is I've glued and screwed this conduit, this uh, trunking to the wall, and I've used the trunking to hold the cables in place. And then all I'll do is come up to this kitchen unit behind here, which I'll show you on the next slide, and here to get to this socket. So there's always a way around it. If you've got kitchen units with voids behind, always make use of those. I mean, what's the point in chasing out a wall if you don't have to? And this will save you so much time. And then when you enter the cupboard, I mean, these had solid backs to them. These were 18 mil solid backs. So fast fix boxes fitted beautifully on these. If not, what I have done before is I've mounted a piece of stud to the wall and then put in metal knockout boxes and secured my, my boxes to those, my accessories to those. As you can see, it looks quite nice. The kitchen cupboards are a great, great way to minimize chasing into walls, hiding the cables in the void behind. Just make sure that you put your accessories as high to the underside of the shelf or top of the cupboard as you can. And that way you avoid people smashing things into them and damaging them or accidentally turning them off, which is what happened to me once. I had a guy that kept complaining and it wasn't my job, I have to say, I was doing the loft conversion and this was in the kitchen that was wired by others. And he kept saying that he had a problem with his oven. And it turned out that they'd rammed the cupboard so full of stuff that the cooker isolator was being rocked partially on and off. And it was sparking and arcing in the back of the cupboard, um, which obviously again generates heat, which could cause a fire. It's also great when you, when you do this and put them up high because then it's easy to access them. It's easy to do an EICR because you haven't, you haven't got to empty the whole of the cupboard to be able to see them all. It's also easy for the homeowner because they can easily identify and find them when they need to use them, hence why I've labelled them as well. Part of the regulation as well says that you can reverse the zones onto the other side of the wall. I wouldn't suggest you do that all the time because there's no need, but what that is great for is that if you are working in one room where there's lots of damage and mess going on, um, rather than then entering into another room and creating more work dust, mess, inconvenience. You can chase down one side of the wall and then drill through to the other. And then all you have to do is just chase in your switch or socket, minimizing the disruption, minimizing the mess, and everyone's happy. And as I promised, this is Mary Werry. Mary Werry died needlessly, and it could have been easily avoidable. Yes, there could have been RCD protection, and yes, it could have saved her, but ask yourself this. If this had been your wife, your child, your mother, would you have not wanted the electrician who installed it to have given her the best possible chance of avoiding this accident? Because if that cable had been run correctly, Mary might still be alive today. And that is our fundamental duty as electricians. We keep people electrically safe. And that cable ran out of its zone, which then meant that it was drew, drilled and screwed into. Money and inconvenience should not come into the equation. And I hear so many people say, oh, it wasn't convenient. There wasn't enough money in the budget for this. That isn't our concern. That's the homeowner's concern. Our concern is to prevent people from being killed or injured electrically. That is our duty. That is our number one 
goal. So as always, I create these videos to help educate, inspire, and open constructive debate. If you've got anything important that you feel I've missed out, or there's something you want to think about, you want to question what I'm saying, please like, share, and subscribe to get these important messages out there. Comment in the, the, the comment box. And as always, thank you for watching. Take care.